Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 201 of Circle Up and Get Real, where we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And I am so excited today to have this conversation with Michael Ivanov, who I just discovered. I kind of feel bad about that, Michael. I haven't known you till just recently. Um, I read three of your four books, and I am currently listening to your current one on Audible. And I'm just really enthralled with your messaging and with you as a human. And I reached out and said, hey, do you want to be in my podcast? And you said yes. So here we are, Michael Ivanov. Thank you for being with me today. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me, Jody. I appreciate it. So Michael is an author. I'm going to go back to your uh, your bio here or your website. His His company is called Speak Life 365. And Michael has a great story about him. Your whole story is so inspiring, Michael. Right now, you're a storyteller, um, interactive facilitator, an author. Uh, you speak a lot for a lot of organizations, but I really love how you got where you are. And, and if anybody's listened to this podcast, you know that's a big part of what I like to know about people is how they got where they are. So, Michael, would you just kind of tell us how you got, first of all, to the United States and where you come from and how you got where you are? Yeah, a little little uh, backstory. So we came from, uh, I came from the Soviet Union in uh, 1989 or 90, I believe. I believe it was 89. So I was two years old when we came. Um, that was right, right when the Soviet Union was kind of collapsing and they were trying to hold people. They weren't, they didn't want people to leave. Um but the only reason we we were able to actually leave was because my dad passed the the faith test. So if you could answer a certain amount of Bible questions, then you were allowed to leave because they were fine with um, faith based people leaving, um, but they were trying to keep citizens in uh, from leaving. So that's how we were uh, able to leave. So they cut up our passports, and um, we get, yeah came to America. So took a, so for a while we were basically not citizens anywhere because we didn't have a Russian passport anymore. And we, you know, we're still trying to become citizens in the uh, in America. So uh, we came to Texas just for a couple months and then moved to Vancouver, Washington, right uh, near Portland. So that's where we've been ever since. Um, how I got into writing and speaking, I mean, that's <laughs> a whole a whole little story. But I, uh, you know, I grew up because my parents were immigrants, you know, my dad we, I have uh, seven brothers and five sisters, so 13 kids in the family. Yeah. Uh, so big family. Uh, my parents, you know, had to make sure they saved every penny to, you know, to survive, to pay, you know, pay the bills. And, and so I learned all, from a young age, I learned all about hard work. I learned about, you know, if you, if you want to accomplish something, you got to go do something about it. You got to go get it. And so I, I learned about hard work. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't a difficult thing for me to understand and see why it was important, but um, I didn't spend too much time thinking about purpose and, you know, what was it, you know, now that we were here and we were in the land of opportunity, you know, there was a little bit more options for me where my parents knew, you know, okay, we're in, we're in America, there's a lot of opportunity, get your education, get your education, work hard. But for me, there's growing up, I realized there's, there's a lot more things that, you know, I was inspired by different authors, I was inspired by athletes. And so I knew that there was something else that I could do. And I, as a kid, I kind of, thought about those things and thought about, you know, it'd be really cool to do something bigger with my life and something more meaningful, something more important. Um, and it, just something out of the ordinary is what, not that, you know, you know, not that someone who has a job is not doing an important job, but um, I just always felt like I could do something bigger. And, but as, as I was kind of growing up, that kind of little by little kind of got, you know, that, you know, as kids we dream big, but then over throughout the, either circumstances or failures or just life, you kind of get that beat out of you. And um, by the time it was time for me to graduate high school, I had, you know, no idea what I wanted to do anymore. I was just more interested in hanging out with friends. And um, so I just picked a career um, just, just to get my dad off my back because my dad's trying to push me to go to college. And so um, I just got into the corporate world and I was working for a, a, a small printing company. I was in, in the IT department. And it, it wasn't that it was a bad company. It wasn't, it was just that, I realized I was, I had to sit down and ask myself, like, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? I'm sitting in this little cubicle, you know, I'm, I just, I'm counting down the days till Friday. You know, I don't, it's, there's no, there was, my work wasn't meaningful. Mm -hmm. 
uh, wasn't bringing me purpose. It was, I was just another, you know, number, you know, just trying to make sure that I do my job right, you know, just enough not to get fired. And so um, really forced me to start thinking about my life a little bit differently. And uh, it was around that time that we kind of, we joined, uh, it was a multi-level marketing company. And uh, I always say this, you know, it didn't, didn't work out well for me, but, um, but they pushed personal development very heavily. And that's what changed. That's what started getting me to think differently and realize, Hey, there's, there's more out there. And if I start thinking first before, you know, setting myself a vision, setting myself a goal and actually really asking myself, Hey, what, 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 what is that thing that I could be doing that would bring me purpose? That would bring me meaning. And, um, it was through that process. I discovered guys like, um, you know, Napoleon Hill with Think and Grow Rich. That was one of the, one of the first personal development books that I read and, uh, uh, someone named Ogmandino. Yeah. He wrote, uh, yeah, the greatest salesman in the world in those books. And it just really started turning, turning my mind and thinking, you know what, like what, what, you know, what else is there? Like, why not just go and pursue? Why not think of the biggest thing that I, that I could do that would bring me purpose. That would be fun to a dream that I could chase down and just go after it. You know, what do I have to lose? And so, um, seeing Augmentino with his reading his novels and seeing, reading his stories about being a motivational speaker and traveling around the world and, the kind of feedback that he would get from people, how they change change his life and how how his books impacted them, and in that same way he impacted me. And so I was like, if I could do something like that, that would be living with purpose. And so that was kind of a a long short story to <laughs> how I got into into speaking and writing. So how what is the time frame between when you were working at the printing shop and you had this aha? that there's something more and where you are today? Uh, a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, reading books like Think and Grow Rich, it's like, okay, if I can just sit and visualize and believe, you know, it'll happen for me, but you you still have to put in the work. You gotta, you, there's a lot of growth that you, you can you can see something up here, but then you gotta make sure that you grow into that person that you visualize in the future. Mm -hmm. And so there were skills that I had to learn that I didn't think I needed to learn. Um, you know, there was a lot of, limiting beliefs that I had to, you know, kind of dig out of myself and uh, in order to be able to take action on some of the things that were the, that opened up doors for me. But I, I could see it in my mind. I could see it up here. I was already a, a speaker, you know, when I was still sitting in my cubicle and I mm -hmm. visualized myself sitting, you know, coming up on stages and, and writing books, holding books long before I ever even wrote anything, even before I started writing a blog, which is how I kind of started getting my thoughts out there. Um, but there was a lot more growth that had to happen than I realized. But that's the beautiful thing about having a big vision is that if, as long as you keep holding on to it and you keep seeing it, you're going to start growing into it and you're going to start learning the things that you need to learn and overcoming the things you need to overcome to get there. Yeah, that's such a great reminder to everyone. It starts with the vision, because if we can allow the vision to pull us into that future, I think that's yes. to me, that's less about pushing and forcing and making and hustle and grind and more about allowing the vision to guide. And and that yeah. feels different to me. Yeah. Cause you can do a whole lot of things that wait, that waste your time. And it, when you're trying to just, like you were saying, hustle and grind and move a lot of times you can, you can, uh, you know, dig yourself into a little bit of a hole or you can maybe find yourself going in the wrong direction. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of, you got to put in the work. There's a lot of, you know, growth that needs to happen in the process but at the same time there's also needing needing to make sure that hey is this thing that I'm doing right now that I'm really trying to push is it still aligned with that vision because I find myself a lot of times where I find myself working 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 and then I'm like wait well this is off track of what the original vision was the original inspiration was in the first place and so I had to, would have to stop and kind of realign and and remember why I started in the first place and so yeah, yeah. so yeah you're uh Go ahead. I was going to say your original question about how long that took. I think I was uh, from from the day I kind of made a declaration for myself that I was going to become a speaker. Um, I think until I got my first paid speaking engagement was probably seven years or something like that. So okay. Okay. <laughs> a lot longer. But yeah, I still yeah. I was still working on that job and I was still trying to find a way to transition out of it because you still got to pay the bills and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So um, if I go back to your original, com our original conversation here, we were talking about leaving Russia and, and you yeah. said your dad was able to answer a faith quiz. And yeah. yeah. so there you have a foundation of faith, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. 
And I'm curious about your parents. What were they doing in Russia? And what had them say, we're leaving and going to America? Yeah, so my uh, my grandfather, he fought in uh, in World War II. So he, um, I don't know if you know much about the, the, the Eastern Front, but uh, the siege of Leningrad, you know, that's when the Germans encircled the uh, city of Leningrad and they basically had it en encircled for three years. They were trying to starve the Russians out. Um, he was one of those guys that they kind of just threw in there because they were running low on men. And so he was sent to fight Leningrad and he got captured there. Um, and then he was in uh, the Dachau concentration camp for four years um, before the, the Americans actually um, came and liberated the camps. Uh, when he came back, so he he became a man of faith uh, that he became Christian there in the camps from, I believe it was fellow prisoners or some, somebody that started talking to him. And uh, when he came back, he's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm, this is something I'm going to share my faith. And obviously for the communists, for the KGB, that was a big no, no. They were anything that they couldn't control was a big you know problem for them. And so they, he was heavily persecuted. Um, so they would do they'd hold church services you know, in people's houses in the community and they'd gather, sometimes it'd be 10 people would show up, sometimes it'd be a couple hundred. Um, but the KGB was always kind of harassing them and always, so um, my, my, my dad grew up with that. My dad grew up with always having his dad, not, not knowing if his dad's going to come home mm -hmm. because, you know, any day the KGB could come. And they didn't, you know, there was no explanation. They didn't need to explain to you why your parent just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, and so when he got a little bit older, my dad started actually helping my grandfather they would go to the German border and uh, people would ship Bibles over to Germany and they'd toss them over and my dad would help kind of smuggle them into the Soviet Union. So it, it was tough for faith-based people there. And I, I know a lot of people kind of deny that there was that much persecution, but my, my dad said for, it was always in order to get a job, you know, for the, they would get assigned jobs and a, a assigned uh, apartments to live in they would always prioritize people who weren't on their blacklist or whatever it was. And so it, it was tough for them. And so my dad with, at that point he had seven kids and he said, you know what? Like I, I need, I need to get out of here. He, uh, he already learned the English language by then. He was reading a lot and he said, Hey, there's opportunity for my kids to be able to grow up in a better environment and in a, in a free country. And so that's, that was his decision too, to try to get us over. Wow. And you were the youngest when you came over or was there another? Uh, no, I actually had a younger brother. I had a two month old. Uh, wow. He was two months old at the time. So, wow. yeah. Wow. That I can't even imagine now today taking that much risk. I mean, I'm I'm just risk averse because I've grown up in America. And for me, I take it for granted all of the things that I don't even recognize are gifts. And yeah. so to think about a young couple with five, five, you said five? Five little kids. Uh, seven, there were seven of them. Seven, the seven, 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 seven little yeah. kids. How how old yeah. was the oldest? The oh, the oldest was, oh, I want to say ten or eleven. I'm, yeah, I'm not was... not not positive. Yeah, ten or eleven. Seven. And wow. and back then it was you know it, it, there was smoking a lot on the plane. So my dad was saying that you know all of us kids were throwing up on the plane mm -hmm. and because <laughs> everyone's smoking cigarettes. And, oh. Yeah, he said that, yeah it was the stories they tell us from from the, that are, you know, from coming over. Wow. So Texas, why Texas? Uh, Texas, because we, there was a, um, a, you had to get a sponsor. So you had to get someone that would vouch for you that like, will at least make sure that they have a place to sleep. And then we were only allowed to come in uh, into the United States. So we had to have a sponsor that confirmed that they'd take care of us. So we had a sponsor um, there in Texas that said, you know, hey, we got a church that you know, they want, they're going to donate some beds, they're going to donate an apartment, that kind of thing. And so we stayed there for a little bit and then they transferred us to a sponsor in Vancouver. So. Wow. And then what, what did your parents end up doing then to build the family and to, you know, now get a career eventually? Yeah. So my, uh, my dad, uh, because he, he learned the language, there was a lot of other uh, immigrants coming from Russia, Ukraine at that time. Uh, so he, he got a job translating. So he was, yeah, almost all his time in um, when he was still working was uh, he was a translator. Wow. So, uh, yeah, in hospitals, um, you know, dentist visits. And then he started even doing um, translating for people in court and that kind of thing. And then he was, well, also uh, going to school at the same time to be an accountant. So, wow. wow. Yeah, so yeah. that's you get this um, this um, never say die um absolutely from them i'm guessing even your grandfather yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. And that it was a big inspiration for me. And it was it was the the reason why I felt like crap about myself so much when I was sitting in that cubicle mm-hmm. and I kind of went through that state of depression because I'm like, okay, looking at my family, the way my grandfather fought for purpose and for and to just to stay alive, and the way my my parents fought, and then I'm here in this opportunity that they fought for, and I'm just wasting my life away. I'm just counting down the days till Friday. I'm just waiting till you know the next you know, party on the weekend. And it was, it really made me feel like I'm living way below my potential. And, and I knew there, I always kind of had this feeling like there's a bigger calling on my life. There's something more. And I, and I believe there's a bigger calling on everyone's life. I mm-hmm. believe everyone, you know, if they really dig down to, to who they are, to discover their gifts, skills, talents, and abilities that they have a lot more to offer than they, they believe about themselves. And yeah. And for me, that was, uh, one of the biggest drivers for for wanting to find something bigger for myself than just than just showing up and working so in those what would you have been what 18 when you got that job and then um... um yeah i was i was uh 20 uh, when i got the job and worked there for several years and um when i made the decision to leave i uh, had no idea what, what i was going to do um, my younger brother at the time was starting a marketing company so i took basically half a pay cut <laughs> and it was a startup. So, you know, sometimes we didn't get paid, yep. but to me, it was just, I was ready to take that step. Yep. I, I I need, I needed some sort of a change. And I knew that, you know, just based on reading those books and I knew that, okay, yes, little st- steps are important, but at some point you got to take, you got to step into the unknown. There's no, you know, no one's guaranteeing success, but I, I have to just bet on myself and at least try. Yeah. Bet on yourself and try. You know, it's so interesting to to see things from that perspective and knowing now that you speak a lot to younger high school students, um, helping them understand some of these things. Would you say that's your favorite audience or do you have a favorite audience? Um, it's, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's cliche to say, but like, I love speak. I enjoy it. You, you know, I enjoy speaking to every audience because I think every, there's so much, and high, it's really fun to speak to high schoolers because they're at that phase where maybe they've already experienced some bullying or they've experienced some kind of beating down of their personality and they're trying to now just blend in, trying to be like everyone else. And so it's really fun to speak to them because you can see their eyes light up. You can see that they're like, they realize, hey, I, I'm still my own person. I can still make my own decisions, not just want what my parents want for me, even though, you know, our parents always want the best for us, but it might not be aligned with what our purposes or what our talents are. And so you see them start to realize, Hey, I can, I can, I can actually do something with, with my life. And that's really cool to see um, and kind of plant those seeds into them. But at the same time, speaking, when I speak to, you know, corporate audiences or associations, you see people that have maybe been beat down by life for, for years and years and years, and they've kind of already put their dreams on back burner and, you know, when you're younger, it's always like, oh, you know, I can still make that happen sometime in the future. And when you're a little bit older, you start to, you know, it's kind of like, you know what, I, I think I'm, I've kind of missed that. I've missed mm-hmm. the train. And it's really fulfilling to speak to people like that and realize and remind people, you can start wherever you're at. You, you know, the KFC, um, Colonel Sanders, you know, started what, at 75, he started his franchise. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, and you can go on and on about the inspirational stories of people who just completely re- just transformed their life at later, later in life and still ended up living, accomplishing big things, but also living with purpose. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's, I always say it's, it's never too late, whether you're starting, or it's never too early and it's never too late to start and, and live to your potential. So I want to talk about your book specifically, but uh, as long as you brought up purpose again, um, it feels like that's a big, one of those big questions that we ask ourselves, what am I here for? What, what is, what is the meaning of life? I mean, some of those real small little questions. <laughs> um, how, how, what's the easiest way for somebody who's starting to get kind of restless, discontented, maybe with the way they've been living to, to discover that purpose? Can you give it in a quick <laughs> little formula or is it a long process? Yeah. Um, I, I tried to in my latest book. I tried to. That I, so my first four books are uh, like they're, they're fiction stories. You know, they're inspirational fiction. But this last one I wrote, and the reason I wrote it was so I can kind of have something to bring with me that's that goes a little bit more off my speech, so then people can buy after conferences and after meeting me. So I try to answer that question. Now, there's people in history that are a lot smarter than me that struggled with the question of purpose. Um, but I always I always try to point people to 
you know, I think if you really dig around long enough, you, if you give yourself time, sometimes you just sit and think. Oftentimes you'll you'll end up back into that thought process of maybe some of those dreams that you've kind of let let by. And um, when when you give yourself a little bit of time to think, um, I, I think a lot of times it gets back to those some of those things that maybe give you a spark or that you you might have been passionate about. And so, but I guess a quick answer would be to try try everything you know or find uh in the book i i one specific point or tip i give is that you go find someone that inspires you because for me that's what it was because you know when you find someone that inspires you oftentimes it's something about the way it's something about what they're doing or it's something about uh maybe the influence that they're having that that inspires you and oftentimes your own purpose lies in that because you're attracted to that for some reason and for me what Augmentino was doing, what Jim Rome was doing with some of these guys, um, you know, Napoleon Hill, I realized that I had this need or this desire to to influence other people's lives, you know, in the same way that I was influenced. Because when I read their books, it was like it was like I could breathe again. It was just like I, I it allowed me to dream and believe in myself again. And so just imitating them when you don't know exactly what, it, what your purpose is or where to start. My suggestion is find someone that that. Um, that inspires you find someone that that you admire for some reason oftentimes that it's your your purpose is hidden in that somewhere so i don't know if that answers your question yeah <laughs> well it's not an easy answer it really isn't it's mm -hmm. very experiential and to me it's very um it needs to evolve and yeah. so it's not like there it is i'm gonna go chase that at least for me yeah. it's been emergent over many years but when Absolutely. I look back, I don't, when I look back, I think about what um, Steve Jobs said about how you can connect the dots of your life looking backward, not looking forward. Mm -hmm. That has become a really fun process for me when I'm older than you. So when I look back and go, oh, that, oh, that connected, oh, that connected, oh, that connected. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that at a younger age, I think you'll notice that they start somewhere, those dots connecting start somewhere. Yeah. And for you, I love that you tied it to your grandfather, your father, the the resolve that your family seems to have, you have in your DNA that that doesn't allow you not to live your purpose. And so that's a double negative, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. It's like a pull from yeah. the future you. Yeah. So I want to talk about your four, four novels first, and then we'll talk about the latest one. Um, I am so impressed with your four, four novels because I don't know how you come up with the stories that you came up with. And some of them required a lot of historical um, research, I would think. Oh, everybody, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 the first one I read was Cabin at the End of the Train, which I loved because it was contemporary. I felt like it was contemporary. I mean, it was now. And I yeah. wanted, I looked up Amtrak to find out how I could take a trip like that after I yeah. read it. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so that one was more contemporary but then the traveler's secret the servant with one talent and the mount of olives are all historical fiction mm -hmm. so how yeah. did you come up with that was it through augment mandino's influence do you think uh absolutely augmentino and uh there's a book uh uh if you, have you heard of the alchemist yes very, of course very, Paulo yeah. Guello. yes yeah yeah so yeah that that book was a big inspiration for me when i was uh starting out as well because it's, it's written, if you read it, it's written so simply, and he's not super detailed in his writing. He's not, like, describing every leaf and tree. It's just something about the simplicity of his story and just that desire to pursue a dream that he just put so well but simply. And so when I was starting out with The Man of Walls was my first book, um, yeah, I just wanted to imitate that, that sense of adventure, that sense of, hey, what if everything in my life crumbled and I had nothing, I was starting from you know, starting from nothing that, you know, because oftentimes people just dig themselves into this kind of situation, these situations in life by whether it's choices or things that happen to them to where they're just stuck. And even though they have a dream, they, they just, there's no give. It's like, well, I can't pursue a dream because I got my children to take care of, or I got, you know, the bills to pay, or I got, and so we kind of lock ourselves in. And so that kind of stemmed from that desire to like, okay, what if everything was wiped clean from my life? I didn't know anybody anymore or I was in a country that I didn't, and I just, I was on my own, what would I do? Would I go and pursue that biggest dream? And so that, that story kind of started from that, like that kind of the spirit of adventure, I, I yeah. would say. And all four of them, while different, have 
something bad happens and we have to make decisions and and there are principles I think you call them principles in some but you call them scrolls or you call them different things in different yeah. books but there's this list of you know five ten things that you can learn in each of your books and to me mm -hmm. they they interact a lot but you could read them all separately as well and so how how was it that you came up with your list of principles for each story? I mean, were they based, again, on something that you had learned? Is it biblical? Is it where, where did they come from? So, yeah, so the servant with one talent, um, that's a, that's of the biblical parable of uh, the parable of the talents. And so yeah. I, I, I love that story because it's a powerful story. It's a it's one of those stories that I uh, that I always kind of go back to that it kind of keeps that fire under my butt of like hey one day we're, i believe we're going to answer for you know the way we lived our life and am, am i going to be somebody that's get, that that returned on that investment this gift that i have this time that i have the people that were placed into my life the opportunities that i have did i squander it or did i do something with it and i love that story because when, when i was younger I'd, I'd hear that story and it was always like the way I, you know because you have the servant that got the one talent the one that got two the one that got five and the way I always learned it was that, oh, that's just the way life is. Some people get a lot, some people get a little. But as I was, kept reading that, the parable, I, I started realizing in the parable, it says to each according to their abilities. So they received based on who they were. And the per, the, ta the servant who got the five talents probably what started with one at some point. Right. And because he returned on the investment, he was entrusted with more. And, and I realized if I want to do bigger things with my life, then I have to at least start with what I have now. Mm -hmm. And if I can invest into the people, the time, the opportunities that I have now, then I will be entrusted with more. Then I can have more influence. Then I can do bigger things. But I got to start here. And and so it totally switched my mindset on that whole parable. And, and it it really should have been a, a story of redemption. You know, the, the servant who got the one, who got the least you know, should have been the one that outworked these other two guys or, you know, whatever. And so I was like, what if I put together a story that is kind of a redemption story to that? The Because you know, obviously the way the parable ends, you know, he gets yes. banished. But um, so that was a, and the whole inspiration for that story. Um, and the principles came from the parable. My first book, The Mount of Olives, the, the 11 principles in there, that's actually my uh, my keynote that I, my most common keynote that I do is I teach those 11 principles. And those 11 principles are, like the when I sat down to write that book, I was like, okay, in my personal development journey, breaking past my own fears and limiting beliefs, what were some of those most important things that I learned that if that I could tell that I could teach to somebody else that could help them start on their journey? And those were kind of the eleven. I know it's a lot. You know, usually it's like three points or five points. <laughs> I always tell that to my audience. I'm like, yeah, I know it's eleven, but you know, we'll go through them quickly. And you know, I'm a fast talker. But they're just, they're simple. They're not mind blowing, but, you know, principle number one is words spoken set life in motion. For me that I put that as number one, because when I was starting out reading the personal development books, I realized that it was my own self dialogue that was keeping me where I was at. That was keeping me from taking a risk from stepping out and pursuing something. And so, you know, before you start anything, you got to start, start to monitor your self talk and start to change that and let your mind and your, let your subconscious and let, um, Napoleon Hill called it you know, the principle of auto suggestion. Start to program yourself in a way to where your mind is now working for you instead of against you. And so, and yeah, that's where all those 11 principles came from in that so book. Good. So good. And I'm not going to have you give away any of the other um, wisdom in the books because people really go out and read them. They, they are easy to read. Um, I suppose yes. they're quick reads, but you, you'll mm -hmm. go back and think about them again. So yeah. as you were describing the, the servant with one talent, I, I went back in my reading of it and went, oh, yeah. And then he, I'm not going to give the story away, but you're exactly right. It's to each according to his talents and, and or, or his, um, what is abilities, it? To yeah. Abilities. To each according to his abilities. Yeah. His abilities. And, and your abilities are not set in stone. Like you said, yeah. you can learn, you can grow. And um, I, I loved, I loved the feeling I had when I read that book. I really remember where I was in my home and what I was reading and the fireplace was going and, and it really reminded me of a lot of things. And that's why I was so taken with your way to um, weave a story. The cabin at the end of the train was so cool because I mean, it's, it, I felt that way. 
I want to get out and go somewhere and just get away from everybody else. And I love that it was Christmas because it was so romantic. There's just something about the way you, yeah. you told that story. That was so good. So you're a great storyteller. Um, you're really good at that, Michael. And I know you know that. But let's talk about the, the fifth book now, the most current one, because you said that one, this is why I'm here is the name of that book. And you said that was so that when you're speaking, your people have mm -hmm. something to take with them that maybe is less about a story and more about principles that they can follow. Is that what the, the purpose of that was? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was my first nonfiction, yeah. um, nonfiction uh, book. And I, I wanted something very, it's a very thin book. I mean, you can, if you sit down and read it, you can probably read it and, you know, depending on your reading level or speed, probably, you know, two and a half to three hours. Um, I, I just wanted something very simple, very practical. I originally started writing it for high school students. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to have something very simple. And then as I was working on it, I was, you know, I'll get emails all the time from uh, from people who read my books, people, you know, much older than what I thought my target audience mm -hmm. was. And then it was kind of, it was a realization like, okay, everyone needs, you know, there's a lot of people that are, whether they're starting or they're restarting. Mm -hmm. And they and they they want a new start and they want to and they want a fresh start and so I was like okay I I wanted to change it up and I you know we worked with my editor to okay let's make this a book more for that anybody whether a high school student picks it up or someone who's in their seventies or eighties picks it up and it's still it's 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 inspirational it's encouraging but also has very practical um, tips that someone can just, okay how do I start today what would be the best way to start today and so that's what I wanted to put that. Uh, to put into that book and when when did you write that one uh so this one we just uh, just released on amazon on uh november 30th so yeah so it's, been, it's um, really uh, new two months yeah very Got new. It. Yeah. so what what's what's happening for you now what what do you love doing most is it speaking is it writing um if you could design your day which i suppose you can what yeah. will you be doing what are you doing yeah, so uh, speaking is speaking and writing. It's like a it's, it's like a two part thing in my life. Um, you know, I, I every morning I you know I have some speaking engagements coming up right now, and um, ones for a, a group of educators, ones for um, more of a political uh, organization, which is my first time doing that. So <laughs> even though I, I like you know I'll, I'll typically stay away from politics in my uh, in my speeches, but it's election season, and so they're they're it's a organization that's getting ready to a lobby or whatever they're doing. Um, but then I'm also speaking to high school students all in the same week. So it's kind of like, a, yeah, so I'm speaking to all these different audiences. So I'm trying to structure my speech to where I can still target each audience, but not so much that it's a whole different speech each time sure. because that it's kind of putting, because I like to prepare and over prepare. So my everyday looks like, um, you know, I'll, I'll get up, I get through my emails, but um, I jump right into uh, going through my speech, I'll look through the, my notes and then I, um, I I will verbally practice it. I like to do it because it gives me when I when I uh, when I study my speech to where I know every single almost word word for word, then it gives me the freedom to actually be myself and add in things uh, ad lib, you know, when I'm on stage. And so I, I'm an over prepare. I like to over prepare. So, yeah, that's my my typical day if I'm I'm either speaking or prepping for a speech or um, working on a new book. So this year I haven't started yet. I was going to start uh, at the beginning of the year on a, on a new novel, but um, we had to push it off just a little bit just because some speaking engagement was coming up that I had to prepare for. Huh. Um, but yeah, that's it's kind of my two part thing is writing and speaking. Nice. And uh, for a for a for fun. I'm getting uh, I'm trying to work on getting my pilot's license this year. So oh really? Well, that <laughs> so, will yeah, help. Yeah, someone try to try to sneak that into my schedule that's going to be a bit <laughs> tough because it's a big commitment but yeah well that'll help yeah. in your all your travel are, are are most of your speeches in person or are you doing virtual as well um mo no mostly in person i prefer in person yeah a lot. yeah yeah it's uh it's a completely different i mean when you're with with right in front face to face with people there's something about especially when you're in a room where it's like every, everyone there is on the same and you can or you can get everyone on the same page and it's kind of like that moment where it's like we try to we leave everything in our outside outside world and and that's what I kind of try to push my audience you know when I start out it's like hey I don't know what you came in here with today I don't know what troubles what worries what what what's on your mind but for this you know 45 minutes to an hour let let's focus on you let's let's put the outside away and let's focus on you and and uh, that and, and that's usually 
from what I found my, from my experience, it's in a live audience is the best way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with you 100%. How do you find your speaking engagements or how do they find you? Is it word of mouth now or do you? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So we get some word of mouth. So we're, you know, we, I'm still, you know, not where I want to be, you know, uh, as far as speaking, we do a lot of uh, outreach. My wife and I do a lot of outreach, but um, we do uh, a lot now. We've over the years, we've built up our SEO. So, um, you know, people find me from my videos on YouTube or Instagram. And so I have a lot of people that will reach out to me just from that find me online as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of both for now. And we do work with a couple of speaker agencies as well. So, All right. Awesome. Uh, yeah, this has been a, just a joy to have this conversation with you, Michael. Thank you for taking a risk and saying yes to someone you had no idea. I think the Think and Grow Rich was what got us connected. When I said, I study Think and Grow Rich, and you said, ah, me too. I'm, I'm glad we found common ground quickly because I'd yeah. really love to um, continue to support your work. Um, it's so important that we have these ways to plant those seeds so that we learn not only what to think, but how to think. That's what I've noticed um, pe when people are in that space where they're shaving off their own um, unique abilities to fit into somebody else's round holes. It's because we haven't been taught how to think. Yeah. So that's, that's where that's I see your work with young people and new to uh, personal development people can be yeah. crucial to the world. Absolutely. And I'd Absolutely. love to hear more about your political experience. This will be an interesting one <laughs> for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that one's going to be a first for me. But I, I figure at the end of the day, of you know, we, we all we all wake up, we all have dreams, we all have our obstacles, we have our fears. And so there's always that battle between what I'm trying to accomplish and what I'm trying to do and and the fears that or the past mistakes that I've made and the past failures that I've had. And so for me, my job to come in there as a speaker is, hey, I'm going to empower you to believe in yourself and start to, you know, be a lot more intentional and purposeful with your actions this year. And then you you accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish by implementing these principles. You know, if you can take control of your mind, you can take control of your attitude. You're not, you know, you take responsibility for your actions, you and you take action when, when the time comes, um, you know, then whatever you decide to do with that, you know, you'll, you'll be able to accomplish it. But those main principles, as long as you can live by those, um, you know, you can accomplish anything in life. So, so good. So that's, it, that, that's the name of your business, I'm guessing has something to do with that. Speaklife365.com. Absolutely. Yeah. It's to speak life into people, speak life into those, those areas where, you know, uh, Henry David Thoreau once said, you know, most most people live quiet lives of desperation and so my my uh you know i title my speech um stay alive all your life you know and that's that's that it's just a, breathe try to breathe life into people in the same way life was breathed into me through these books through through augmentino's books through jim rome speaking through napoleon hill books and so yeah it's okay. it's fulfilling so if somebody's heard something that they would like more information about and would like to get a hold of you michael what's the best way for them to do that uh, uh, my website, which is speaklife365.com. Um, I spend way too much time on Instagram. That's where I hang out the most. <laughs> uh, my Instagram tag is, uh, at, uh, the Michael Ivanov. Okay. And, uh, and then of course I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and all those, but, um, Instagram is probably the, where I spend the most time as far as social media. And then, uh, my website, yeah, it's, it's a good place to find me. Awesome. So are you looking for more speaking engagements? Are you looking for more opportunities right now? Or are you no, pretty Yeah, always. Okay. Always. Yeah. We're we're yeah, we're we're the, a big part of our the beginning of our year with my wife and I as we spend a lot of time kind of prepping for a lot of speaking engagements you already have to have booked, you know, mm -hmm. from a year because a lot of conferences will book, you know, a year in advance. So um, but yeah, we're 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 busy trying to fill up our schedule for the for the the last half of the year right now as well. So awesome. And we got a little baby on the way as well. So, oh, congratulations! <laughs> this is your first in, in June. Yeah, that's gonna be my first. Uh, it's mm -hmm. gonna be a little girl. So, oh, congratulations! But, I look forward yeah. to seeing that too. And Michaela is your wife, Mackenzie. Mackenzie, M A K. -E M A K. Yeah, Mackenzie. I read about it. she was in mentioned in the cabin at the end of the train. I think. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I included a lot of my own personal life in there as well. 
yeah, I figured that must be her. And then she has a different last name. So I was just a little bit like, is this, is this who we're talking about? You, you see yeah. how I really looked into you. <laughs> I've become a fan of yours. Um, so is there anything I haven't asked you, Michael, that you'd like to share? Um, I, anybody who's listening to it, to everybody who's listening, never forget what you're capable of. Um, and if you don't believe that yet, just keep digging, keep reading, um, and keep exploring. It's never, it's never too late to, to find that, that thing that you're passionate about, that thing that you can serve people with. Um, but also at the same time to, to find fulfillment in. So never give up on yourself. Wow. Great parting words. Thank you so much, Michael, for being with me today. And Absolutely. everyone, as always, go get real. We'll talk again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. I'm going to stop. <laughs>